Well, we're going to cover inflammation, omega-3 fats, and cell membrane optimization. So we're going to look at what is a cell all the way through to what should we eat and why does it matter? Uh, my name is Clint Patterson. I run a business called Rheumatoid Solutions, which is sort of the second evolution of what began as the Patterson program. Now we have involvement with doctors and experts, and we have physical therapists and all sorts of uh, experts in the field all help our members to reduce inflammation in a collaborative way. So we've evolved from an online course into a service to help people with arthritis. The usual disclaimer for any kind of presentation like this, that it's not medical advice. And this information is based on scientific evidence and also my personal experience helping what is now over 16,000 clients around the world who follow our systems to reduce inflammation. But make sure you check with your doctor because we're all uh, at different stages of our health on different meds. Now, on our series so far, we've covered two presentations that are related to the gut. And the first one was all about diet and how the diet can impact the microbiome and how the microbiome in turn impacts us in so many different ways. And then the second presentation was regarding medications because the gut is so sensitive to medications because the gut has to metabolize everything that goes in through the mouth. And this includes the drugs that we take orally. And so we need to make sure that we're not taking two steps forward with our diet, but then going three steps backwards with the drugs that we're taking for the condition. And so I would urge anyone who hasn't seen those two uh, presentations to go back and watch those because this is all part of the big picture, which is how to regain confidence and control over your uh, arthritic symptoms. And today we are going to jump down to the lower right hand quadrant, which we're going to look at the cellular health solution. So what to expect in this presentation, we'll just go into what are cells, because they're not something that we think about day to day, uh, how cell membrane composition is linked to inflammation, the impact of dietary fats, both saturated fat and polyunsaturated fats on your cellular health, how to optimize your cell membrane composition via diet. We're going to touch upon supplementation of omega-3s and if this is necessary or not, and if so, how you should go about it. And something really cool is that you can now do home tests for your omega-6 to 3 ratio. And so we're going to cover that and how you can get that done. And the benefits of, all, of implementing all of this <clears throat> in terms of reducing systemic inflammation, higher tolerance of more calorie-dense foods, meaning that you'll be able to eat higher fat foods without consequence and the reduction of food sensitivities, which is really prevalent in people with inflammatory arthritis. So let's get stuck into it. Now, I apologize for the labeling on this diagram. They are a little hard to see, but that's okay. I'll walk you through that in just a moment. But first of all, what are cells? Cells are the building blocks to all living organisms. And what's really crazy when I was researching this for my book, so the content today is coming from my upcoming book. Uh, and we we originate from just one cell that, can, that just divides and divides and divides. And that one cell, which is called the zygote, is actually a combination of your father's uh, composition and your mum's composition when they come together in that magic loving moment. And they combine to create this single cell. And that single cell divides and divides and divides in an insane number of, of, of replications. And each cell has a slightly different function and form in the body. So we end up with around 30 trillion cells, which is just absolutely mind-blowing. And we create something like 2 million blood cells every minute. So the number of cells that are being produced, recreated, dying, cleaned out of our body at any one time is beyond our capacity of comprehension. Um, and they all come in different types. So I mentioned blood cells, which are freely moving in the body. But then we'll have, for example, muscle cells, which are tightly packed together to form muscle tissue. So they are building blocks. Think of tiny little, the most fundamental Lego pieces that make up all of our body. The cells are complicated, very complex. But for the purposes of our 
presentation today of understanding inflammation, we only need to focus on one area of the cell, and that is the cell membrane. But just for completeness, there are a couple of other interesting parts of a cell that are worth just revisiting, which is the nucleus of the cell, which is obviously the center and heart of the cell. This is where our DNA is. And also we have in there the uh, mitochondria, which is the energy center of the cell. And this is the energy in the cell is produced from the oxygen that we breathe in. So as we take a breath in, we bring in oxygen to all of our cells and with the food that we're consuming. And so those tiny food particles that end up consequently from after our food is digested enter the bloodstream, they can combine with the oxygen in the cells and stored as energy, uh, as ATP inside the cell. So that's how it works. So we've got all these cells, crazy numbers that are uh, inside us, and they are being fueled by our oxygen and food. So let's just look at the cell membrane. So here we're just totally drilling down on the membrane that encapsulates the outer portion of each one of these cells. The important thing to know here, firstly, is that the cell membrane has proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Sometimes we think of it as only fats, whereas actually the bulk of the weight of a cell membrane is actually coming from the proteins. And the proteins, carbohydrates, and the fats make up that cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane itself is mostly optimally composed of opposite facing polyunsaturated fats. And you'll see over here on the far right, it says a bilipid, bi meaning two, lipid meaning fat. So two fat layer. And there are two carbon bonds in the structure of the polyunsaturated fat. And this gives it a little kink. And as a result, when they face each other in an opposite way, the kinks in the carbon chains means that they don't pack too closely together. Consequently, these membranes have fluidity to them. They can allow nutrients into the cell and they can allow the cell to exhale and to get out of the cell some toxins, waste and whatever. This is a really, really uh, optimum um, situation for the cell because it needs to communicate or to exchange nutrients in that manner. So a healthy cell is a flexible cell and one that has a fluid membrane. And this is achieved through polyunsaturated fats. This creates the fluidity. Saturated fats can also end up in the cell membrane. And the saturated fats do not have that double carbon bond. And as a result, they can pack really tightly. Tightly packed saturated fats in our cell membrane leads to cell rigidity or stiffness, not allowing nutrients to flow through the cell membrane. Rigidity is associated with rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and obesity. And in studies, it's found that rigidity is associated with inflammatory markers of rheumatoid arthritis like SED rate or ESR. So uh, just some references there. We need to reduce our intake of saturated fat. These foods are not exactly uh, uh, controversial to omit. I mean, if you look at all government guidelines, there are typically recommendations about upper limits of saturated fat because they are known to have negative health consequences. But now we can put that also in terms of cell membrane composition because we want to reduce the saturated fat from a point of view of making sure that our cell membranes have more fluidity and are not tightly packed and rigid because of saturated fat. So far, so good. Okay, so we've talked about saturated fat. We know that if we reduce saturated fat, we can make our cell membranes more fluid. And in doing so, we know that this reduces the inflammatory markers of folks with inflammatory arthritis and most likely other inflammatory conditions. And we saw earlier uh, some commentary around some other conditions on an earlier slide. And so then we ask, what about the polyunsaturated fats in the membrane? 
So these are fats that are liquid at room temperature. Saturated fats are all solids at room temperature. So that's why we see all the meats, also coconut oil. It's a real tricky one because coconut oil is actually a solid at room temperature. So it's a saturated fat. But what about the polyunsaturated fats? Okay, so let's talk about those now. So these are oils. These are stuff that are liquids. And it gets a little more complicated if you look at this slide, but I'm going to walk you through this. So don't feel overwhelmed. We're just going to go through some key points here and I'll explain why I even put something so complicated onto a presentation. The reason is, is because this is the pathway of the creation of the long chain polyunsaturated fats that end up in our cell membranes because they don't look like the ones that we eat. Our body has to convert the polyunsaturated fats from the ones that we eat into the ones that end up being suitable for our cell membranes. So there are two pathways. <clears throat> there is one to create the omega-6s, long chain, and there's one to create the omega-3s, long chain. So again, they start out short chain and they go through a process and end up long chain. This happens in the liver. Okay, so the liver does all of this magical conversion for us and the liver uses enzymes to do the conversion across several steps. And so that's what's being depicted here in the diagrams. We've got down the left-hand column, the, the omega-6 pathway from short chain to long. And on the right hand, we've got the omega-3 pathway from short chain to long. So they start out on the left here, the omega-6 with linoleic acid. So this can often be found in processed foods, cookies and things like that, uh, animal fats, vegetable oils, things like sunflower oil, safflower oil, corn oil, all things like that. They are linoleic acid. And then a few enzymes are applied to this, like that more carbon bonds are added, uh, some manipulation is done. And then eventually they come out the other end as a rachidonic acid. On the right-hand side, we've got the omega-3. So we think of these in terms of the majority of the composition of polyunsaturated fats in chia and flaxseed. And they are alpha linoleic acid, omega-3s, and they go through the exact same enzymatic process to end up then coming out the other end as EPA and uh, DHA. A lot of you be familiar with the uh, discussions around brain health and DHA, since it's an it's a, uh, important fat for brain health. And the EPA is more associated with inflammation reduction. We're going to talk about all that in just another few slides. <clears throat> so let me give a metaphor. After I, first of all, just show you that at the bottom of this, I'm just going to show you, uh, we've got that same cell membrane diagram again, the one we used earlier. So at the end of this process, those long chain polyunsaturated fats enter and become parts of our cell membrane. So it's the classic, you are what you eat in a very literal way. The saturated fats, the polyunsaturated fats, we are literally from a fat point of view, what we eat. So let's think of this now in terms of metaphor that uh, I ad-libbed with our friend Cyrus from Mastering Diabetes on a, one of his summits. Imagine you had a factory and that factory makes sweaters. And the factory only makes two different types of sweaters, blue sweaters and red sweaters. Now, at the start of the factory line, we naturally have to provide the material to manufacture those sweaters. And so we can put red material in and the workers will then proceed to take that red material along the way and build the sleeves and everything and end up being a red sweater. Likewise, if we put blue fabric in the start of the manufacturing line, the workers will grab that blue fabric and the same workers will then work on those blue sweaters and sorry, blue uh, uh, processes until we've got a completely blue sweater. Then. At the end of that, what happens is then those red sweaters and blue sweaters get displayed in the windows of the department store. 
So if you were to look into the window of the department store from the pedestrian uh, side of it, you would look in, you would see all these red sweaters, all these blue sweaters, and the ratio of those sweaters would correspond roughly to the ratio of the amount of material of red or blue that was put in at the start. So we're going to pick up this metaphor again shortly, but I just want to set that platform so that you can see how that process works. Now, where it gets really interesting is what happens when the cell membrane kicks out those sweaters into circulation. So this could happen through an enzymatic trigger. The body says, I need those fats now, or it can have happen from cell death. So the cell dies, they get released into circulation, which is the bloodstream, or it can happen from oxidative stress. So there's 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 an environment where the cell is not well and the cell is releasing fats because they're getting oxidized. Okay. So if that happens, then another two pathways present themselves. These two pathways are the ones that are on the screen now. And Enzymatic activity happens on the freely available polyunsaturated omega-6 fats, and enzymatic pathways happen on the freely available EPA and DHA. The, the uh, pathway that results in the enzymatic activity of the long-chain omega-6s results in eicosanoids, as I've labeled down here, which can be pro-inflammatory. By contrast, as a result of the enzymatic activity on the long chain polyunsaturated fats that are kicked out of the cell membrane, you can have anti-inflammatory metabolites. And the pro-inflammatory, the prostaglandins and thromboxanes, these are what create the redness, the inflammation that we see in our joints, or if we if we have some kind of inflammatory response. And they are the exact enzymes that are targeted by aspirin and ibuprofen. So what we are seeing here is the behind the scenes science on what these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs do. They are trying to inhibit this enzymatic conversion from the free omega-6s that have been bumped out of our cell membranes into the creation of the pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. So we can actually influence the quantity of these COX enzymes here and the production of the eicosanoids through dietary manipulation so that we end up having a greater percentage of the blue sweaters in our cell membranes that when they are kicked out and broken down, and let's imagine they then become just some sleeves, some blue sleeves and a blue chest piece, well, they are anti-inflammatory compared to the red sleeves that are separated and the red chest piece, which are the eicosanoids on the omega-6 pathway. We can manipulate our diet and end up having more of the omega-3 long chains in our membrane. So what matters most is the ratio, okay? Because if you have, say, 50 red sweaters putting into the pathway, but if you put in 100 blue sweaters, remember that the workers work with what they've got, you're going to end up with more blue sweaters. Okay, so what we know historically uh, in our evolution is typically humans evolved on a ratio of the short chain consumption of omega-6s and 3s to a ratio of around 1 to 1. And the studies are pretty consistent with this. Today in Western culture, we're putting 25 times more omega-6 short chain fats into our body typically than what we are omega-3s. It's considered healthy, sufficiently healthy, as long as we're less than 5 to 1. The Japanese, however, believe that it needs to be more like two, two to one, which is more similar to what our evolutionary past used to be. Right. So the reason that it is considered healthier to have a 
lower omega-6 to 3 ratio and countries are putting in guidelines to go down this path is that a lower ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s in our cell membranes is associated with a lower incidence or severity of several chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, osteoporosis, and inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. That's what the science is indicating. There are some of the references for that. So it's pretty easy to understand that if we want to work on our ratio, the easiest way to go about this is just reduce the intake of omega-6s. This is an extremely effective way to go about it because some of the oils that we consume if we're casual in our eating can be so heavy in omega-6s that it makes it virtually impossible for our manufacturing process to end up any making any of our blue sweaters. If you have a look at this table here, if you look at coconut oil, for example, it has 504 milligrams of omega-6 and absolutely zero omega-3. So if you were to do as the paleo community, keto community would suggest and go and fry up something in coconut oil, then you are getting, in terms of a mathematical equation, an infinite amount of omega-6 compared to omega-3. Flaxseed oil on this list, which is the second one down, is the only one with a positive relationship. The rest, as you can see, are very, very pro-omega-6. That's the canola oil, walnut, olive oil, sun sunflower oil, corn oil, peanut oil, more. Take a look at safflower oil down the bottom. This is an oil that's sometimes used in deep frying cookers. And if you ever think about having a uh, some French fries because you're vegan, you think, oh, you know, I'm healthy, I can go and have French fries. Think again when it comes to deep fried restaurant cooking, you're getting so much omega-6 and, and zero omega-3 that it, it really skews that ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s. The, the impact is, is massive. So with folks with rheumatoid arthritis, I call these seed oils the kryptonite for rheumatoid. I see far greater impact of the oils, even if someone cheats on that, as people cheat sometimes, than when they cheat on a, a dairy yogurt or even have a steak. Not that people do that frequently, but of course, I've been in this game for 10 years and I know that people do this sometimes. The consequences are far greater from the oils and it's immediate. So this is like the huge takeaway. We need to reduce this omega-6 intake of seed and vegetable oils. So the question often comes up, what about this, this lot here? These are some commonly eaten foods that people love. I've touched upon coconut oil. Coconut oil is just junk food. It's got no fiber, no nutrients. It's just pure saturated fat that is going to throw out your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Next, we've got olive oil, everyone's favorite. So olive oil actually is mostly composed of omega-9 fats. And this is something we haven't even discussed yet in this presentation. The three polyunsaturated fats are omega-3, 6, and 9. The nines your body manufactures itself, and it's kind of the, the Switzerland of oils. It's sort of neutral, doesn't play a role in either of the earlier two pathways of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And because olive oil is mostly omega-9, it doesn't really fit the category of what we've been talking about thus far. However, the fats that it does have in it in omega-3s and 6 are skewered heavily towards 6s, 14 to 1. And so one could argue that it has maybe a slight inflammatory impact. And then people say, well, what about the Mediterranean diet, et cetera, et cetera. And so because there's so many studies and so many arguments and so much debate, I just stick with the rheumatoid arthritis uh, literature. And in the studies that have been done in the rheumatoid arthritis literature, there is no anti-inflammatory impact of consuming olive oil. Okay, there is none. So there is no 
benefit from an anti-inflammatory point of view of consuming olive oil according to the studies. Therefore, you know, we then need to take it on the on the viewpoint of are oils good for you? I'm going to show you on the next slide. Okay, so olive oil and avocado oil, which is the next on the screen here, uh, pretty much a similar argument. So what I've said about olive oil applies to avocado oil without the studies on RA. I can't find any. It's just not being investigated. And then we look at nuts. So nuts are great if you are looking to put on weight. Nuts are great as an additional source of fiber to vary up your diversity for your microbiome. Some nuts like pistachios have particular antioxidants like melatonin that can have some health benefits. And so overall, nuts can be eaten in moderation, but not when you're highly inflamed. Let's talk about the gradual dietary fat increase that is needed to compensate for an inability to handle high fat foods when we are in dysbiosis and we are inflamed. A fatty liver, a liver that results from eating too much of a Western diet, equals a preferential conversion of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. This means that if you have a lot of saturated fat in your diet, you will end up with having cell composition that will preferentially make more of the red sweaters over the blue sweaters, even if there were an equal amount put in at the start of the two different color fabric. Okay, so that's crucial. And I think this is one of the key differentiators is to why we need to stay low fat when we are coming at this and looking to improve our health. We need to start with the low fat platform. In addition to that strong position, all fats increase oxidative stress through advanced glycation end products. This is important too, because advanced glycation end products, and I'll talk more about oxidative stress in a future presentation. It's des It deserves an entire presentation. It's got a chapter in my book, and I'll go through that. Oxidative stress is a position in the body where we are creating more free radicals than what we are able to offset through our own antioxidant supplies. When we consume foods that are high in free radicals, then we tip ourselves further into an oxidative stress environment. And the studies on rheumatoid arthritis are really fascinating in this area because oxidative stress markers actually correlate with disease activity like inflammation markers. So we don't want to increase oxidative stress via advanced glycation end products. And it happens regardless of fat source. Okay, so we can't get away from it. Next, all fats create bile acid production, and there is an interplay with bile acid production and intestinal permeability. That's a little complex, but I don't feel comfortable with it. And I think it's another area where we've got to be cautionary with fat intake when we have dysbiosis or leaky gut, a microbiome imbalance. And then 8% of RA patients have villus atrophy. So this is a, a damage of those tiny villi that are on the intestinal wall that increase the surface area of our gut to be able to absorb more nutrients from the foods that we eat. As a result of that, we have less pancreatic enzyme lipase secretion. What does this mean in simple terms? It means we don't have the little scissors or enzymes created from our pancreas to help break down fats. This is a small portion of the RA population. However, that combined with all of the other bullet points on this screen really lead to anecdotally me observe that virtually everyone with RA just does better on a low fat plan, a whole foods, low fat plant-based diet. And then with time, as their liver health improves because they've gone to a plant-based diet, and they've eliminated those, uh, those toxic sources of processed foods and saturated fat and overeating uh, protein cholesterol, the liver improves and then it gets back into balance with its processing in a regular way of the short chain and long chain omega-3 fats. It's been shown that people who are on a plant-based vegan diet 
have more omega-3 fats in their blood than those on an omnivorous diet. And so we don't need to be concerned with eliminating um, meat products uh, or um, high omega-6s from our diet. The studies on this are, are sound, and so it's, uh, it's all good. Now, even hero omega-3 foods like flax have no impact on C-reactive protein. So a study was done on cardiovascular patients, and a study was also done on rheumatoid arthritis patients, where a large amount of flax in this rheumatoid study, 30 grams a day, was put into the diet without any other dietary change. And after six weeks on that plan, the folks who were consuming the high intake of flax seeds reported that they had less pain and their disease activity scores, which is uh, into like a checkup from their doctor, showed that they did better. However, their C-reactive protein, which is the key inflammatory marker, their SED rate, as well as rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies were all unchanged compared to people who didn't add the flax. This is supported also by a meta-analysis literature review across healthy adults who consume uh, more flax. There's no change in C-reactive protein, the key inflammatory marker. So we don't need to chase these higher fat rich omega-3 foods because all of these first aspects of disease management come into play as well. And overall, I can like hand on my heart tell you that I've been doing this a very long time. Start low fat and slowly increase your fat intake as tolerance allows. You can test those foods a little and you'll see, oop, huh, symptoms returning. My, my liver's not quite there yet. I'm still fatty liver from all those burgers I've eaten for 10, 20 years. Um, I'm still, I'm too sensitive with my oxidative stress. I haven't exercised enough to enable myself to tolerate these uh, high fat foods, my glutathione levels uh, and so on, are still too low and so on. All right. Now, most importantly, well, I think we've already cleared up the no oil, but most importantly, <laughs> never cook with it. Okay. So what happens is when we cook with oils, it goes from basically being a bad food to like the worst thing you could do, which is why the inflammatory response is so great with people with arthritis. I ex experienced firsthand that even if you're in a state of stability, as I was for my rheumatoid arthritis for like five years, I ate a deep fried set of potato wedges and a big oily veggie burger at a US restaurant. It was late at night, no antioxidants. And that set me back the next day. And it set me back for a long time. I uh, Symptoms resumed for the very first time in many years. And it was very hard to get symptoms back under control again. And that led me to all the research in the negative impacts of cooking oils. They become a free radical bomb. So it's it's tremendous amount of oxidative stress arises from doing so because these fats are very sensitive to oxidation, which is why olive oil, for example, is always in dark bottles at the grocery store. It's because light can oxidize it, heat oxidizes it. And so when you heat it to very high temperatures on a hot, pl hot plate, you're going to an order of magnitude of more free radicals in the body. What about supplementation? The research shows us that it's actually really hard to get to the optimal target of five to one or below with diet alone. I've found this myself and I see this with clients, even who are doing everything that I know is to be right. We know that Western diet is approximately 25 to one. We know that vegans are better than that. They tend to be less than 14 to one or less than 20 to one, but that's still quite a ways from the five to one. And I'm seeing typical results anywhere from, uh, I've, I've seen some five to ones through to as high as 76 to one for people with rheumatoid arthritis who are just about to start our program but I don't have a before and after. I don't have data on people who've been plant-based on our program for a long time. So omega-3 supplementation may help. This is optional. This is something that's worthwhile having a discussion around. The studies suggest that there are benefits for folks with rheumatoid arthritis. So 
you know how these studies present their conclusions. It's not like uh, in these instances, the, the conclusions are like maybe of benefit, um, demonstrated uh, benefit in a laboratory setting. Uh, and maybe of benef benefit is what the meta-analysis say, looking at hundreds of studies across this over the last 40 years. Algae is better. In fact, fish oil is actually contraindicated for many conditions in which there is a lot of oxidative stress. So again, I want to highlight this importance that these fats oxidize really fast. And if your body is full of oxidation, which is associated with inflammation, as typical of any rheumatoid arthritis patient who's not in remission, those fats can enter into the body and become oxidized very quickly and never actually reach the cell membranes to which they are intended. As a result of that, you've then got a bunch of oxidative fats circulating in your body. And these actually are a source themselves of inflammation. And so we must make sure that if we take through supplementation omega-3 fats, that we take omega-3 fats that are protected from oxidation. Fish oils, which are purified, right? They try and remove the smells. They try and remove the toxins like mercury, which are a real problem in the fish oil industry because our oceans, according to the World Health Organization, have concerning levels of 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 these uh, heavy metals in all of the fishing areas in the world. So, uh, so, so they purify them, remove the natural antioxidants, which are present in the actual original version of the oil and sell them as supplements. So algae, it's just as good. It doesn't need to be more expensive. It is sustainable. It doesn't deplete the fish stocks, the oceans. It is better for the environment. And because the algae comes with built-in antioxidants, it's actually better and more effective for the body. Okay. And then even though the uh, it has those features, it's still best to consume if you do do supplementation of omega-3s with a meal rich in antioxidants. So you want that meal that you have, you want lots of leafy greens in that meal. You want to maybe eat alongside with the meal also maybe have some fruit because we need as much protection to chaperone those delicate free fats into our cell membranes where they belong. So you should find out what your omega-6 to 3 ratio is. And so I have identified after a long search, the best home testing kit that I believe exists. And I've put details of that over at rheumatoidsolutions.com forward slash omega-3. You can get a home-based kit that is sent to your house. You open it up, you prick your little thumb or finger with a tiny little uh, included little uh, loaded, spring-loaded uh, pricker. And the blood goes onto a little uh, piece of cardboard. You put it back into a self-replied envelope, put it in the mail, off it goes. Two weeks later, you get your results. Is an online comprehensive data. And uh, you go through that and you can learn what your omega-6 to 3 ratio is, what your omega-3 status, arachidonic acid, the whole thing all comprehensively laid out for you. The great thing about that is then you can make an evidence based decision as to whether or not your current dietary plan needs adjusting, whether or not you might want to explore a supplement, or whether or not you should high five your family members and say, we're crushing it. We've got our omega-6 to 3 ratio below 5, therefore nothing left to look at in this area of our health management. The supplement that I take is also on that page. And the reason I'm not going to mention that because over the years, if someone's watching this in three, four years time from now, I may have found a better alternative. So this is just going to be the location of where I feel the optimum testing and also the optimum uh, products are at, and it will change with time. So we want to measure what matters. With rheumatoid, we measure our joint range of motion. We measure vitamin D status because that's crucial. We measure our C-reactive protein and our SED rate to keep an eye on our inflammation. We measure our joints for erosion via x-rays and ultrasounds. And we also keep an eye on things where necessary with MRIs. And now we want to also 
measure our omega-6 to 3 ratio because of the strong evidence to support an association between a better omega-6 to 3 ratio with better inflammatory outcomes. So the key messages are we want to start with a low but adequate fat intake on a whole food plant-based diet. If we eat all plants and eat at the early stages of our program, we want to emphasize lots and lots of leafy greens. And we're trying to hit 1.6 grams of ALA a day, which is uh, for an adult male, which is 1.1 gram for uh, adult females. But you'll want to check that for your own. This it's hard to get there. It is hard. We're just hitting the leafy greens. You have to eat a lot of leafy greens. Um, you may want to add an optional, just a tiny little bit of ground flax if it's of concern. You can go onto an app like Chronometer, I think it's called, and many of these are apps that show you dietary intake based on the data you put in for how much sweet potatoes you ate, how much quinoa you ate, and it'll give you that feedback. So just check that. We want zero dietary oils. And never, ever, ever cook with oils or eat foods that have been cooked with oils. If you're inflamed, that is your kryptonite. As we improve our digestive health, our microbiome, and especially our liver, we'll be able to increase our fat intake if we want to, if that's something that we would like. If we're not worried about adding a few extra pounds or we want to just go to the gym, we need some more calories, then things like nuts and seeds can be eaten in moderation to help us uh, to achieve that. And then algae omega-3s can be considered. Take a look at your omega-6 to 3 ratio first, uh, either via the link that I shared or you're in the States. Um, I think Quest Labs will even run the omega-6 to 3 ratio. Ask your doctor if you want to go down that path, if it's covered by insurance, for example. And so you can find that out through uh, different ways if you want to go down a different path. And if you do supplement, make sure the supplement contains an antioxidant. In my case, I there is a small amount of polyphenols associated with a small amount of olive oil alongside the algae, which is a, a very effective chaperone for the omega-3s to enter the cells. You can look into that approach, or if you're only using foods with your supplement, make sure you're eating it with lots of antioxidants. Okay, that's me. And I don't have a last slide, which again is just, uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm over at uh, rheumatoidsolutions.com. Uh,